Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Chance favors the prepared mind is a quote from Louis Pasteur, the French chemist and microbiologist, one of the most important founders of medical microbiology, whose remarkable breakthroughs has and will continue to save many lives. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our discussion today, as our guest, a neuroscientist, has had significant contributions to this field, having advanced knowledge in mitochondrial and neuromuscular disorders. Our guest today is Professor Sir Edward Byrne, AC, President and Principal of King's College London and Chairman of King's Health Partners Board. He was previously University President and Vice-Chancellor and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences of Monash University and Vice Provost for Health at the University College London. Ed was also the Founding Director of the Melbourne Neuromuscular Research Unit and the Centre for Neuroscience. He has also previously served as Non-Executive Director for Bupa and Cochlear Limited. For services to higher education, Sir Ed was awarded a knighthood in the Queen's Birthday Honours in October 2020. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blender Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. In this episode, Ed joins us from London in our Sydney studio and shares with us his journey, which has seen him go back and forth between the United Kingdom and Australia, the significant breakthroughs in neuroscience since he was a young doctor in the 70s, and setting the motion behind the momentum which has seen the universities he has led be amongst the best in the world. We cover the constantly changing environment universities have to navigate, the need for better communication, the ever-growing shift to new methods, and how we can prepare to strike when opportunity comes. So sit back and enjoy. Chance favours the prepared mind. Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Greg. Great to be with you. Ed, whereabouts in the UK did you grow up? Northeast, an area called Tyneside, a little seaside town called South Shields, which was part of the Newcastle conurbation. My dad was a GP there. And we moved to Australia. I was 15 uh, on the boat on the way out. So you're a Geordie by background? Geordie, yeah. My dad was uh, from an Irish family. There's a big enclave of Irish people there. My mum was Welsh. And what brought mum and dad to Australia? Uh, it's a long story. My dad was in the British Army through the whole Second World War. Okay. He came from a humble family. His father was a miner, coal miner. Right. And my dad was really impressed by the Aussies he became friendly with when he served in the desert. And after the war, the through army scholarships and the like, he had the opportunity to go to university and become a medical doctor. So he was the first in his family to do that. And he never quite settled after the war. You know, it was a very disruptive thing uh, in his life. And he always saw Australia as some sort of promised land. <laughs> so he, uh, he was always looking for an opportunity to come. He had one or two attempts that didn't work out and then became a sort of GP psychiatrist and got a job as a psychiatrist working for the government in Tasmania. And that's where you first started to live in Australia, in Tasmania? I was a year ahead of my age because of an exam I passed in England. Mm-hmm. So I, um, I did about six months at school in Tasmania and then went straight into university. I was only 17 when I started and I did wow. my first degree there and moved to Adelaide to do the young doctor years and to uh, specialise. 
the medical school in Tasmania had just opened and Adelaide University sort of stood behind it and supported it. Well, I guess, it. what makes you decide to become a neuroscientist? And what is a neuroscientist? It was more a neurologist, you know, medical specialist. Sort of drifted into medicine. Uh, it was much easier to get in then than it was now yeah. because pretty much everybody got taken into the first year and then the cull occurred at the end of the first year. And I thought I wanted to do a profession. You know, I wanted to do something that gave me a job. Uh, I didn't want to be a lawyer. My dad was medical and he really loved it. Probably was influenced by him, but not completely. And so I thought I'd do medicine. And as I got into it, I loved it. It was really made for me. I found it intellectually stimulating and working with people in the clinical years, which is fantastic. Again, with neurology, at that stage, and I think still now, I, I wanted to be a physician a diagnostician rather than a surgeon. Okay. And in the training years, you did attachments, you know, as a young doctor, cardiology, gastroenterology, neurology. And neurology appealed to me the most. I think it was because of the diagnostic complexity and the intellectual challenge, which was you know, probably among the greatest of the different medical disciplines. And also there was an opportunity, there was a training vacancy because there were only a handful of people training in neurology in Australia at the time. And I was lucky enough to get taken on as a sort of, in the vernacular, an apprentice neurologist. And as an apprentice neurologist, where was our standing in, in that regards to the world? At that stage, it wasn't a really very well-developed speciality in Australia. There were a couple of very strong neurologists in Sydney and one or two people in Melbourne, but most states had either you know, one or two neurologists max. You really had to leave the country to train as a neurologist, go to the States or the UK. A lot of Australian neurologists had trained at the Institute of Neurology in London, which is a place called Queen Square, which was the mecca of world neurology, sort of then and now, really. They reserved one training place in those distant times for somebody from Australia. And I was lucky enough to get that, which was probably my big break, because many of the great names and the history of neurology were still working there and I had the opportunity to work alongside them and learn from them. What I learned there was I think in Adelaide I had brilliant consultants that I worked for in Adelaide who gave me a really good grounding in diagnosis. What I realized more and more as I got to London and probably it was just being a little older too is that our understanding and ability to treat serious brain disorders was minimal and there was a real opportunity by being an active researcher to contribute to new knowledge. So I had some fantastic mentors there, and I realized, which again was probably the, uh, the final waking up in my career, that as well as treating people, I wanted to improve our knowledge and our ability to treat the conditions they had. Uh, so I split my life from then on between active research and patient care. And in active research, where do we stand now in Australia? Oh, it's been, a, uh, well, in the world, really, it's been a, uh, it's been an amazing journey. We've yeah. gone from understanding virtually nothing about the majority of brain illness. Uh, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about psychiatry. There's a, there's a divide between psychiatry and neurology. Neurology is physical disorders in the nervous system. And our knowledge when I started was really weak. CAT scanners were just coming in. When I started training, there were no CAT scanners in Australia, much less MRIs. And we've seen the most amazing advances, the advances in neuroimaging. You know, the way one used to work out where a brain tumor was, was that somebody like me examined the patient and by very complex and long examination, you would work out which nerves weren't working and where the dysfunction was. Now you still do that, but you confirm it with a scan, which is rather more accurate. And then the genetic revolution, which hadn't occurred uh, when I was a medical student, genetics was you know one lecture. The genetic revolution has transformed brain medicine probably more than any other area. And Australia's in the thick of it, you know. I mean, in Melbourne, where I, I, I should say, after doing my doctorate in London and finishing clinical training, I came to Melbourne for the first time as head of neurology at St. Vincent's Hospital, which is one of the two or three major teaching hospitals there where most of the brain medicine was, or a lot of it. And 
I went on to become the first professor of neurology at the University of Melbourne when I was quite young. And I established a thriving research unit where we made some breakthroughs. And alongside me, other hospital-based neurologists in Australia began to build up research. So we became a very prominent nation for our size in in new advances in brain medicine. And it's still an area where Australia has a leading presence, especially given its size. So what are the major breakthroughs we've been privy to in this country? Well, in my area, major advances in what's called metabolic neurology. Uh, My own advances related to a field called neuromuscular disease, where I've worked in a number of areas, including muscular dystrophy. But probably the major advances uh, my group made were in understanding how energy that comes from oxygen made in a little organelle called the mitochondria is defective in a number of important brain illnesses. And we were one of the leading groups in the world in that. Uh, We also discovered that this mitochondrial impairment is a contributor, not the only cause, but a contributor uh, to both the aging process and some age-related neurodegenerative disorders. In stroke, there have been massive advances in Australia, in Alzheimer's disease, and I would mention epilepsy also. My colleague Sam Berkovic, uh, also a Melbourneian, is one of the world's leading epilepsy researchers. So it's like anything, you know, when you start to build up a critical mass, people get inspired. You know, one or two people see it, other people. People see that things are happening, they want to come and work with you. And before you know it, a situation has been transformed. I think when I came to Melbourne, there might have been seven, you know, six or seven, maybe seven neurologists. Now, I think there'd be 150. And it's similar right across Australia. Why did I want to work with you, Ed? In the early days, I think it would be because... Uh, well, I mean, I don't, you, you know, the most odious thing is to heap praise on oneself, isn't it? But I, I think I've always been a caring individual, both for uh, patients and their families and for young doctors training with me. I've been aware of their interests and the need to help them and assist them. And I always had high standards. You know, I chose a uh, an area of medicine where there was no room for error. I'm not saying that errors never happened, but, uh, you know, I mean, really, you had uh, no margin. And I think perhaps if you came to st- work with me and study with me, it would be that I was offering a training and research also. And almost all the young neurologists who trained with me, and there were many, uh, all went on to do a PhD and uh, had a research aspect to their career. It sounds, you know, a little silly to people who aren't in a profession, but even in a profession like neurology, which is very varied, and you're meeting new people all the time, if you're doing more or less the same thing for the whole of your working life, you can run out of steam a little bit in your late 40s and 50s. And to have that added interest that not only are you seeing people and diagnosing them and treating them and helping them, but you're also very actively trying to develop better diagnosis and better understanding and then better treatments for the patients you're looking after, just makes it an even more interesting job than it otherwise would be. And people who are attracted to that would want to come and work with somebody like me. Ed, you mentioned the aging process. Can I ask a really basic question, which is how long is our brain built to last for? About 100 years, I think. If... uh, you know, I think after this, so it's it's like Alzheimer's disease. You no, know, Alzheimer's disease, old timers disease in the vernacular, it used to be uh, unheard of when I was a young doctor. There were two lines in the medical textbook because life expectancy wasn't that great. You know, most people didn't get much beyond their mid sixties, and Alzheimer's disease really hits its prime in the uh, late seventies, eighties, nineties. So as life expectancy goes up the incidence of Alzheimer's disease goes up, but also a general failure of the brain. But I think if you're lucky, you know, you can keep good thinking, good judgment. Uh, Your memory might not be quite what it was, but you can keep going at a pretty good level to about 100. And that's why in the treatment of dementias like Alzheimer's disease, even if you don't get a complete cure, if you can push out the age of onset by, say, 10 years, uh, you would dramatically reduce the incidence. And how do we push out the age of onset? Well, I think we're well on the way to doing that by very good understanding of what causes it. And we still have a way to go there, but the the new genetics have helped there enormously. And by managing a series of risk factors, 
it's become apparent that for dementia in general, for most people who are unlucky enough to, to get dementia, you know, other than at the extremes of life, it's a series of cumulative things. You know, you, you, you have a knock on the head when you're young, you drink too much, you smoke, uh, you have high blood pressure, you have a little mini stroke, and all of these things cumulatively add up to result in a sort of cumulative impairment as you enter uh, old age. Now, you know, of course, that's not the case with everybody. Some people are predisposed to get things like Alzheimer's disease, and they're very unlucky. So it will be very early detection of uh, people who are prone to develop these conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and then uh, elimination of as many risk factors as possible. And eventually there'll be magic bullet cures, but, you know, they'll be a long way away. Well, what percentage do you think we know of the brain? I'd say when I began, I can't say nothing, you know, because the... uh, the great neurologists and the neuropsychiatrists of the late 19th and early 20th century, who, who were either German, French, uh, or in London, yeah. had made very significant breakthroughs. We, you know, we knew about MS, we knew about motor neuron disease, we could diagnose them. We were starting to get some knowledge of brain tumors. But I would say that when I was a young doctor in the 70s, our knowledge was probably 5%. And I would say now it's probably 40%, heading to 50%. Diagnosis is good. I'm talking about brain illness here, I should say, rather than the brain itself, which is a different question. But in brain illness, our diagnosis is good, our understanding is good, our ability to treat important conditions such as stroke is infinitely better, although we still have a way to go. But for the degenerative brain diseases, although our understanding this is Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, the diseases of old age that take people into nursing homes. Although our understanding is a lot better, our treatment still has quite a way to go. And I think we'll see all of that happen in the next 10 to 20 years, sooner, hopefully. Understanding the brain is a tougher question, you know, because the ghost and the machine, what makes us think, what makes us the people we are, I personally don't think we'll ever quite understand that. Ed, can you sort of talk us through the mystery behind research. How does it survive? And how do universities raise the money? The two or three things you need, you know, firstly, the thing that drives all research is personal curiosity, whether it's physics or humanities, uh, any area. It's always personal curiosity. You know, you, you have a desire which eventually becomes a very deep driving desire if you catch the bug to discover new things. And generally, most people who get caught up want to discover new things because they see it as things that are important uh, to the well-being of others or to the planet, you know. So the huge amount of research which is going on today in areas like sustainable development and uh, climate science, the massive uh, investment in health research because of the drive to improve the quality of people's life as well as longevity. And then secondly, you obviously need a... uh, a government and a country which regards these things as important and which is willing to put resource in one way or another. Australia is pretty good on that. You know, it's not the the most generous research funding country for its size, but it's certainly in the upper quartile. The UK and the States is a little, the research funding environment is a little bit more generous. And research funding usually in the main comes from government, you know, and the best way to do it is by independent review. So you're funding projects of excellence because a lot of research isn't excellent. And then the thing that sits along beside that is private benevolence, which is a huge funder of research around the world, especially medical research. And during your career, how much time have you spent in engaging in the benevolence area? When I was setting up research institutes in Melbourne, a lot of it was fundraised. We would fundraise mainly from the neuromuscular, muscular dystrophy community with brilliant colleagues because patient support groups around the world, but especially in Australia, regard research as incredibly important. And although a lot of the fundraising that's done voluntarily goes into direct patient support, which is crucial for patients and their families, they're also very generous in funding research. And the researchers interact with the community. So I used to meet, speak to regularly to families with neuromuscular disease. I'm still a patron of the Australian Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, which is a wonderful group too. 
uh, the muscular dystrophy associations around Australia, uh, and I know the one in Victoria reasonably well, it was brilliantly led by a guy called Boris Strzok. He became one of my closest working colleagues for many, many years. And what was it like joining the leading medical research university, UCL? You know, my career, I should, there's sort of a step there. You know, my career, um, I'd become good at running things, I guess. And uh, this led me to be the dean of the health faculties at Monash University, which is a very research-intensive university, Australian university. And that went well in my time of leadership. So I was able, uh, with some surprise actually, to get the job running health at UCL, which is the strongest medical research university in Europe uh, by some way. And uh, it added attraction because the institute I'd worked with, there's a young man in London, Queen Square, the Institute of Neurology, had been absorbed into UCL. So in a sense, I was going home. And that was wonderful. I was able to play a role in some fantastic developments, um, bringing on some huge research programs, uh, establishing new institutes with others. I played a role in establishing an institute now called the Crick Institute, which is the largest medical research institute established in the world in the last 20 years. I played a key role in a new institute for what we were talking about earlier for neural circuits and behavior. I brought the hospitals and the university closer together and it was just a fantastic time in my life. And I had the most amazing colleagues. And I mean, I'd learned this lesson ages ago that you know the very famous American anthropologist Margaret Mead when asked if a few committed people can change the world, a few committed citizens, she said, well, nothing else can. And at UCL, as at Monash, and indeed as at the University of Melbourne, I was able to build up a team of fantastic people who work well together. Because that went so well, <laughs> I was given the opportunity to come back to Monash as the vice chancellor, the head of the university, yeah. uh, which is Australia's largest in some way, internationally, possibly most prestigious. That's arguable, of course, because every Australian university thinks that. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it's certainly the most international Western university and has campuses all over the world. So I got Monash from you know, around 200 of the rankings, uh, well up into the top 100 where it's continued to improve. A lot of my career has been mentors and the vice chancellor who preceded me at Monash a chap called Richard Larkins I'd worked for as his Dean of Medicine and also worked for him when he was the Dean of Medicine at the University of Melbourne. And he's one of the inspirational people I've based my career on. He, uh, he's just a wonderful person who uh, had that golden touch. Uh, I'll say getting the best out of people. I don't mean that in any condescending way, but he was a brilliant mentor, you know, one of a number I've had. Well, what made you make the big move, Ed, from, as you say, heavily invested in research, which you have continued throughout your career, but more into, as you say, the leadership and the administration. It was more a slide, you know, rather than a, uh, a decision that as uh, my research groups grew in Melbourne, the University of Melbourne, I found myself responsible for huge budgets. I was a little out of my depth. I, I mean, I was a clinician researcher, you know, and uh, I, uh, so I did an MBA uh, through the uh, then Mount Eliza Business School. It took me two and a half years. I did it while, uh, while doing other things. And that interested me a, a little bit more in that area, but I still didn't see myself in predominantly a managerial person. I still don't. But because I was very good at that, you know, you, you end up, you can't do everything. I was sort of managing a huge enterprise. I was running research labs. I was seeing patients. And in the end, something has to give. And I, uh, it gave for me when I was given the opportunity, uh, you know, I've been interviewed, to take over the health faculties of Monash. And I realized then that it was a transition point in my career. When I went there, I didn't envisage, you know, what would follow. But of course, when you go in a particular direction, and if you're moderately competent at it, it often takes you uh, to other places. So I, I would never have imagined as a young man, uh, you know, that I would end up as the... Uh, president of one of Australia's major universities, much less transitioning back to London as the president of one of the greatest universities in the world, you know, in the, in the centre of what I still think, even in COVID times, is the world's great city. I'm going to come to that in a second. So you're a vice chancellor of Monash. And as you said, you've moved up the rankings. What were the key changes you think you made to achieve this? 
You have to, you know, the uh, famous uh, Great to Good book. And one of the uh, messages in that book is know your mission. Monash had reached a stage where it grew through multiple acquisitions, that it had multiple missions and didn't really have clarity about what its key mission was. And its key mission, in my mind, was to be one of the world's great research education uh, institutions. You know, I, th I think all universities do an equally good job, but they have a different space. And Monash had the opportunity and the potential to be one of the very greatest universities in the world, however measured. And I, I tried to give it focus. Now, that, that meant some hard decisions, you know, uh, you know, some parts of the university which were really great it, it weren't really aligned with that research intensive mission. Monash had a brilliant country uh, campus in Gippsland, which was really a regional university. And I was instrumental in merging that with the University of Ballarat to form a new university, Federation University. And I believe it's now thriving. It had campuses internationally that weren't working that well uh, and needed to be uh, restructured. But the core of the university was fantastic. And I concentrated on uh, improving productivity, uh, both in professional staff and in academic staff, and as well as uh, you know, growing brilliant people internally, drawing a lot more new talented people from around the world into the university. Monash is now firmly established, I think, as one of the top I'll say three or four, you know, Australian universities, depending how you measure them. Ed, what actually is, in your mind, the role of university? I think it differs. You know, I, I don't think there's one mission. I think some universities have a predominantly teaching role, and the young people should be taught in an environment where knowledge is understood and the creation of new knowledge is understood, but not, not every teacher and not every area of the university needs to be research intensive. And I think about three quarters of universities around the world are in that category, including in Australia. You know, so if you look at the US, which has 3,000 universities, mm -hmm. only about 150 are accredited to give PhDs. And then the regional universities, you know, that have a regional support base, Federation University that I mentioned is one of those. They do good research. They do research which is attuned to the needs of their region. And they, uh, they educate young people for the range of talents and jobs the, uh, the region needs. And then the great research universities, you know, the Columbia's, the Cornell's, the King's in London, the ANU's. Uh, that uh, and there are not many of those in the world. You know, there are probably around a hundred, and when you get towards the top end, there are about twenty-five, and they're universities where many of the great breakthroughs occur that um, will take the world uh, successfully on its journey in every field. And some people think, well, is that a good system? You know, is it better to have a flat system where the, uh, I'll call them the brilliant people, the brilliant researchers are spread evenly, but that doesn't work really in terms of output. You know, brilliant people feed off each other. Yeah. And if you can get these clusters that's why Oxford has done so well in Cambridge. You know, you, you get these clusters of absolutely brilliant people. The very best in the world are drawn in and you have breakthroughs occurring much more rapidly. So it's a, it's a complex ecosystem. And my particular expertise, and I, again, this sounds like odious uh, self-praise, but it's just the way my career has gone, uh, is at the top end of the uh, research-intensive uh, university, knowing what makes them tick, knowing what makes them thrive. And it's taken me a long, long time to learn that. Ed, when I first went to London as a young headhunter, I remember going into a very, oh, must have been a first or second interview. And I sat there across someone very seasoned. I looked at them and they were a chief exec. And I asked them, what did you study at university? And they said they read the classics. I said, okay, that's interesting because in Australia, when I'm going to move into business, I'm charged with in Australia leaving high school to study a Bachelor of Commerce, yet university in the UK is encouraging me to think and pursue something that I enjoy before I then move into sharpening my pencil and becoming a business person or in that particular area. Why is it so different? I've thought about that a lot, you know, and I, I think you can make both systems work provided in your business degree, uh, you have some broad elements of other things. Otherwise, I think it's a little dry, you yeah, know. I agree. Uh, uh, Australian universities got around that in part by offering double degrees. Mm. They tended to be in overlapping fields, you know, like law and, uh, and business. So the, the two models really are the, uh, 
you know, and I'm talking here about training for the professions, you know, you get straight into professional training in your undergraduate degree. But is that what a university set out to do? Well, I think it's just the way it's been, you know, so, and it's difficult So medicine takes five to six years. You start as an undergraduate, you're still six years and you, you just, you haven't even started your specialist training. Uh, so it's quite complex. And, and I think one way is to build broader experience into the undergraduate degree. A better way, theoretically, is, uh, is what you've just said, you know, and, and that finds its full force in North America, where uh, if you have the opportunity, you go to a liberal arts college right. uh, and you have three years of fantastic general uh, in science as well as arts, you know, uh, exposure. Uh, and then you go to a graduate law school or medical school or engineering school or whatever. That is uh, the University of Melbourne and UWA in Perth have tried that system a little bit in Australia. The upside is obvious, you know, a broader education, uh, you're a little bit older before you make that pivotal career decision. And I often wonder, you know, what if I hadn't liked medicine? <laughs> Luckily, I did. But if I hadn't, you know, six years on, I would have been stuck with an absolutely useless degree that fitted me for nothing else. So I, I think graduate entry medicine and a lot of Australian schools have now gone in that direction, has a lot to commend it. You know, and, and that's probably the case generally. I mean, uh, you know, if you'd done liberal arts, uh, w would you have done your second degree in business? You know, I mean, it might have been something else. Yeah. So I think the basic principle is that universities should give people a general education for life, a yeah. broadening, and also if they're doing a professional course, train them for a particular discipline. And if they're going to do that for, through simply one undergraduate degree, then that undergraduate degree needs to be broadened to make sure some of the general growth material is in it and it's not too narrow. What about what we're facing now, Ed, where I'm studying via online? Now, is that serving the purpose? Admittedly, we're in COVID, but let's talk pre-COVID. Should I be attending the university and rubbing shoulders with the other sharp young fellows and ladies who are going to dominate the future and bounce ideas off them? I think it differs. You know, I think for your undergraduate degree, which is in part, you know, uh, I mean, I guess we continue to grow up through the whole of our lives. Yeah. But the, uh, your undergraduate experience is a period of sort of accelerated growing up, you know, where for many people, you, you get away from home, you get away from your school group, you meet lots of new people, you're exposed to lots of new thinking, you're That's right. in universities today, you meet young people from all over the world, you know, and the, uh, the learning is as much from one's peers and from personal interactions. So I've got no doubt in my mind that, you know, that that is best as a physically in-person experience. I mean, not everybody can do that, I know. But I think postgraduate's a little different. You know, you're more mature. Generally, you're in the workforce. And I think if you're doing a master's to broaden your, your thinking or even change professions as an adult, I think you can do that quite satisfactorily online uh, because the quality of the educational experience uh, can be just as high. I've developed a series of online masters with the big educational company Pearson and the uh, the satisfaction, they, all for adults, you know, not for first degrees. And the, uh, the, uh, the quality of those and the satisfaction students have, I think, is every bit as good from an educational point of view as on campus. But of course, you do miss out on the bar and the personal interaction. What about the MBA? How should that be done? I did an MBA. I think you can do it a number of ways. The one I did was... I mean, obviously, you can do an executive MBA, which is, you know, as you know, intense, short periods, and I think very high quality, incredibly hard work. Okay. The MBA I did through Mount Eliza, which is now part of the Melbourne Business School, was really designed for people who were uh, were in the workforce. Yes. It was hard to do it. Every month, I did a six-week, six-day live-in. That was really intensive, 12 hours a day. And then... There are a series of uh, lectures and things in the evening uh, before the next uh, subject. Uh, there were 16 modules and you did the exam uh, for each module at the end of the living period. I didn't do anything other than work and do that for about two and a half years. So I'm, I'm surprised my dear wife and children put up with me, but they did. I think the thing about an MBA is I think it's incredibly useful for people like me who don't have a business background but I'm not convinced 
how useful it would be if you haven't already done one for somebody like you who has a business background you know because it's uh, it's very broad general stuff so i i think there's still a place for it but i uh i'm told by my business school colleagues that the you know the high noon of the nba has passed fair enough now you made the move to london back to london what were you tasked with when you joined king's college london every university has its story you know and King's um, still was, but had been in the past, even more possibly one of the greatest universities in the world. You know, I mean, the university right in the heart of London. I mean, you know London. I yeah. mean, King's is on the Strand, you know, going to uh, go to Westminster. You couldn't get, couldn't get more central. And the big hospitals and Thomas's and Guy's are uh, the ones right at the centre of the most famous hospitals in the world. And um, many of the major discoveries in medicine had occurred at King's or in its affiliated hospitals. Physics had had umpteen Nobel Prize winners. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell discovered the you know, laws of electromagnetism there. The st- structure of DNA was largely discovered at King's through Rosalind Franklin and fantastic people in literature, Thomas Hardy, Virginia Woolf. And it had become complacent, you know. It had, uh, it had felt in a way that no Australian university ever would, that it was perfect and complete unto itself. It was in the centre of London. People came to King's. The rest of the world didn't matter. And then it woke up and thought, you know, we're not where we need to be in rankings and what have you. So uh, I came in to give it some impetus. And I realised rapidly, you know, well, it, it, and again, this sounds trite. I mean, I, I realised rapidly the, the health schools were brilliant, you know, all top three in Europe ranging from one uh, to 10 in the world, number one in the world in dentistry, number one in the world in nursing, number one in the world in psychiatry and psychology. So brilliant health schools but and huge, but the uh, very good in social sciences and humanities yep. and a really strong law school, but no real business school. And for a university with umpteen Nobel Prizes and physics and the like, quite weak. So I, I built up the areas of the university uh, that weren't as strong. Uh, I launched a KBS King's Business School, which is fantastic. It's done brilliantly so quickly. And I extended activities that were aligned with London and with the UK government. So we've now got the major university think tank related to government in the UK. We've got a school for government that I got Alexander Downer, a former Australian politician to lead. He's done brilliantly. What is a school for government? I was reading that. I've never heard of that before. It trains public servants, civil servants. Is that unique to the world? No, there there's schools. There's an Australian and New Zealand school of for government. You know, it's a it's a smaller school. The school for government at Kings takes civil servants in partnership, the civil services, the public service in the UK, as you know, it takes, uh, you know, middle level people of promise and they have a, a master's level course that they do through what are called micro modules, short courses, while they still continue to work. I um, recruited an old friend, Julia Gillard, a former Australian Prime Minister, to set up an in- international institute for women in leadership, which has done absolutely brilliantly, you know, and there are, there are numerous examples of that across Kings. But the, the main thing I did was, you know, institute a process of broad staff and student consultation and stakeholder consultation to give Kings a new mission. We called it 2029. And it was brilliant research, brilliant education. All universities have that, all the great universities. But it was to be the great civic university for London and to be a university which in every way was in service to the world. And the service agenda has transformed the university and the civic agenda. So I think most people in London would see King's as London's university in a way that they would not have done even just a few years ago. And that that has huge opportunities, you know, because being in, I'll say, one of the world's great capital cities, not that Sydney and Melbourne are great cities also, but there's not as many people come through them, you know, because they're not really hub cities. For our audience, Ed, can you sort of give us a bit more understanding of the scale of the operation? It's not nearly as big as Monash. You know, Monash has 85,000 students and 15,000 staff. King's has about 35,000 students and 10,000 staff. But budget in Australian terms, two and a half billion Aussie dollars, translated into pounds, you you half. So that's a uh, 
a bigger budget than ANU and Adelaide, but a smaller budget than the University of Sydney. And has King's moved into the top 20 on the global ranking? It's been in and out. So we, uh, you know, the three rankings and we got up to uh, 15 and one of them one year. But I'd say our position at the moment is more top 30 uh, than top 20. But the momentum has been established. The partnerships you've arranged. I understand you've done a lot in hospital sector and the medical sector. Do you want to talk us through some of those examples? It's something I've been lucky in that in, in Australia, I had the opportunity to sit on hospital boards and what have you and run one huge medical school, health schools at Monash. So at UCL, I was on the main public board, their hospital board. But I also had the opportunity to serve on the group board of Bupa, massive uh, private health company around the world. And I learned a lot about health governance. At UCL, I brought many of the big hospitals north of the river, Thames, uh, into alignment with the university through the creation of an academic health science center. Mm -hmm. And when I came to King's, which has probably the most effective academic health science center in the UK, right. I had the opportunity to chair the board, which I still do, uh, which covers fantastic institutions, the university itself, Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital, which you'll remember, St. Thomas's is the one opposite the Houses of Parliament, Westminster, uh, Guy's is around the Shard, if you don't know where that is in London, and then there's huge hospital in Lamb, King's College Hospital, Denmark Hill, but right next to it, the Royal Maudsley, which is the major psychiatric hospital in Europe. So I've chaired the combined board, and bringing those entities together with joint programs uh, in all of the major areas and aligning the research and education effectively with clinical care has been incredibly exciting. This is a journey that Australia is on, okay. and I had the opportunity to help stimulate something similar when I was at Monash, but I know well the uh, activity at the University of Sydney. I understand there's also a similar activity at University of New South Wales, uh, both of which have terrific partnerships uh, with the uh, health sector. It is there much difference from your perspective in regards to emphasis in education between Australia, UK, US, different parts of Asia? Not really. I mean, there's certainly differences of detail, but right around the world now, the the model that came out of the UK and Europe has been adopted, you know, so uh, professional training is generally pretty similar and people are taught pretty much the same thing, whether you're in China or the US. The school and university system may vary around the margins, but, it, but it's broadly similar. The Australian system and the UK system I mean, the differences between Scotland and England and Australia has taken some Scottish things and some, some English things when it comes to its universities. But putting that to one side, the school and university system in the UK and uh, Australia is almost identical. It's why it's so easy for people like me to move backwards and forwards and uh, why there are quite a number of UK vice chancellors in Australia and New Zealand uh, and, of course, uh, Aussies uh, running universities over here. I think there are about half a dozen. You've co-authored the University Challenge, Changing Universities in a Changing World. What's the main messages? The main message is that, I mean, I'm a university person, yep. so I have to say that universities, I think, uh, continue in many ways to do a fantastic job. But the message of that book is that the world is changing with dramatic speed. The information revolution is gathering momentum, fourth industrial revolution, and jobs for Australia and the UK are 4.0 the social demands, the, uh, uh, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals and the needs for the, of the planet. If um, much of the creative potential in a research sense is centered in universities as it is at the moment, then those institutions have a massive responsibility to produce outputs that work for regions, countries, uh, and the planet. And I don't think, I mean, I mean, there are many uh, examples, of course, where brilliant things have been done, but I don't think across the board, the university uh, sector has been doing enough. And I wrote that book with Charles Clark, who's a former education minister and Home Secretary, Interior Minister in the UK in Blair's government. And our joint feeling, and we 
writing a book to somebody else very difficult because you you've got to write each chapter again and again so you agree on stuff but it, it makes it better but uh, our, our agreement our, our final position was that i mean we enunciate this in detail uh, is that you know universities need to communicate what they do better uh, they need to do what they already do better but they need to do new things and we called it finding a new gear uh, universities need to find a new gear I think one reflection of the fact that that gear has not been completely found is the way in which universities are currently regarded by many in the general public and by the political leadership, which is nowhere near with the esteem that it was 20 years ago in many cases. So what's happened there? Why has it slipped? I think universities have become perceived as being, and I, look, I'm, I'm talking about a generality here to make a point because I could give numerous examples that prove this uh, in, in my own area, health, for example, where the regulations are really good. But I think universities are perceived by many as having become a little bit dissociated from the, uh, the main themes of the nation. They're seen by many as have been a little bit slow to get onto the jobs of the future uh, story. Uh, many see them as not closely connected enough with, I'll call it the outside world, with business, with industry, where the links need to be seamless. There's a perception that the ivory tower philosophy of the past hasn't completely gone. The university people and leaders would dispute that, you know, and they'd have many examples. And the, the truth is probably halfway between the uh, two stories. If I was to look at the ASX 100, 200 and 300 in Australia, I wouldn't see many university professors on any boards. If I look at the US, I would see a lot more. I think that's true. I mean, that's a bit association with Australia. I think in the UK, you see more too. Uh, I'm unusual in that regard and that I, you know, fortunately, the people I work for gave me permission to serve on big boards. So I had, I had 18 years on the Cochlear board and I was, uh, I was very engaged on that board. It was, it was a huge journey. Uh, so I, I helped at board level take Cochlear from a small company to a, a small big company and a very, very good success story for Australia. I served on the Booper board, as I've mentioned, both in the UK and Australia. I think it is good to have more senior academic leaders on boards. It increases the diversity of input on boards. And I, I do think, I mean, I'm probably outside my uh, territory here, but I, I do think some boards in Australia, you know, the gender equity issue has been improved a lot. But I do think there's often a narrowness of background, you know, an accountancy, a consulting, a legal background, perhaps a lack of diversity. And I think getting some, you know, research intensive leaders onto boards more broadly can only be a good thing. You talked about the research from the university perspective and where it's maybe could have improved. Is that on the commercialization of that research? Yes, that's part of it. You know, the UK does better than Australia in commercialization and the US does better than the UK. Australia is starting to do better, and people like the new VC at the University of Melbourne, Duncan Maskell, is a real expert in this. So, you know, bringing people like Duncan in will, will I think, have a huge impact. Australia is starting to do better, but still has a way to go because it's the whole ecosystem and, you know, the ability to make startups work, to take startups into sustainable long-term companies, uh, to have the investment profile, the management capacity, all of that. It's, uh, it's tough for a smaller country. Uh, so Australia doesn't do badly, but, I mean, I think it could do better. Uh, it's, it's not Sweden, for example, and Sweden's only half its size, uh, probably a third or a quarter of its population. I think this is one area that uh, has to improve. You know, Germany, uh, for the size of its population, is still the most effective uh, country on earth. And, you know, for a country of less than 100 million people to have its uh, productivity is just phenomenal. And the university sector there is seamlessly linked with industry. Look at the number of people on German boards who have PhDs. In the commercialization of research, but if I look, flip it the other way, you've said you've sat on boards in corporates. Yeah. And you've had the pleasure, as you say, sitting on the board of Cochlear, where there was a, a, a huge investment in research and development. Yeah. Is there enough encouragement outside of a couple of companies in this country in research and development? Because it seems to have slipped. 
the government would say there is. You know, I think industry leaders like Rick Holiday Smith, who chairs the ASX and is still the chair of Cochlear, would be able to suggest, you know, improvements of policy. And I think what I've seen in the UK, I mean, it was beginning when I was at UCL, but has accelerated dramatically, is a massive increases in government research funding. So the government research funding in this country is doubling over the next three to four years to close to 50 billion Australian a year. They also have massive private funds like the Wellcome Trust sitting alongside here. But the new funding is not simply like the old funding, you know, it just has to be excellent and peer reviewed and uh, we'll fund it. Um, It's very closely aligned to national need and national productivity. And I think Australia needs more of that. You know, it's, it's getting some, but it's still a relatively small part of the overall research funding pool. It's possible in Australia to get major strategic initiatives up but it's more difficult, you know. I mean, I was involved in getting, as I said, the Crick Institute up. They'd, they'd had, you know, the building was almost a billion pounds. And I was able to get that years ago with others, I didn't do it all myself, by accessing a number of funding pots where people had strategic capacity to make decisions. That's hard to do in Australia, you know, and uh, it has happened in the past. You know, there have been some big attempts in IT and a number of other areas. But I don't think in a sustained or large enough scale way, and CSIRO, of course, uh, does a lot of the heavy lifting in Australia, but through, through CSIRO university industry partnerships, you can pick already uh, the half dozen major growth and productivity cones that are going to, that are transforming the world now as we speak. I mean, just turn CNN on and look at the ads that are coming up, you know, and see the where the investment is going in the States. Australia has the opportunity to develop real capacity in these areas, but it's a small country. It can't do everything, and it needs more focus. What's it like in London at the moment, Ed? It's a bit grim. The first wave of COVID was terrible here. Everybody knows people who've died. The second wave is... The hospital that I'm in, in the King's Health Partnership, uh, we're in the one of the COVID hotspots. So we, you know, we went from large general hospitals treating everything in a normal way to intensive care units with you know increasing the number of ICU beds in two of our major hospitals from 40 to uh, to 400 each. Now the second wave, which is going through at the moment, is different. Although the cases are high. A lot more people have been tested and the more young people uh, who are turning up positive who, unless they're incredibly unlucky, don't get a severe illness. You know, the, the worry is that they pass it on to others. They're vulnerable or elderly relatives so, or people they run into. But treatments are getting better. You know, the discovery that steroids help, some of the new pharmaceuticals to come out of the States are really starting to make a difference. And ICU staff have learned a lot about how to treat COVID. So uh, at the peak of the first wave, the mortality, if you got into ICU, was well over 40%. Now I think it's something like 10 to 15%. You know, that's still a lot, but it's a lot less than it was. So uh, look, at least in parts of the world like this, we're moving into a situation of endemic COVID, uh, where it's going to be around for quite some time and people have to learn to live with it. The way I think it's been dealt with here, a lot has been learned, is that if you get a local surge, you have to have a degree of lockdown because it's the only tool we have at the moment to stop the surge and stop the hospital system being overwhelmed. So the Victorian government, I mean, I, I know you could argue about uh, how it got into that situation, but the lockdown they imposed was exactly the right thing to do. Whereas if they hadn't done it, they would have had a paralytic situation for their economy for a lot longer and a danger of their health system being overwhelmed. But those lockdowns are a a crude tool. Uh, And of course, one has to get to a situation where if they are needed, they're very surgically delivered to localised areas rather than whole countries. And everything else is done to, to keep the the system going and you know that involves wear masks wear masks everywhere basically social distancing wash your hands and effective test and trace as they have in new south wales so that when a uh, case is detected people around the person are isolated and it's kept confined Uh, and then if you add to that 
the Swedish thing of uh, not everything has been good with the Swedish experiment, but if you add the Swedish thing of protecting vulnerable people, you have a, the beginnings of a model whereby the world can cope with endemic COVID over the next 12 to 18 months, because I'm afraid it's going to be with us uh, for that long. And, uh, you know, Australia, the tool that Australia is using at the moment in the main is closure of borders. It's almost impossible to get into Australia. But it's almost impossible to leave Australia as well. I mean, I'm assuming that that can't continue forever. And, you know, so I don't think Australia can isolate itself from the from the COVID world. And it's probably going to have to get into a mindset of being able to deal with endemic COVID uh, in the same way that countries are in Europe, although it is a much more severe situation here. Is it ever going to go? Yes, it will eventually, you know, I mean, uh, unless we're very unlucky, it will mutate to a less severe form of virus, which happens every year with influenza, and there will be vaccines. We'll have vaccines that have partial efficacy, probably targeted at vulnerable people. I'm very hopeful uh, in the first half of next year, but having a vaccine that works well enough that has rolled out to uh, 7 billion people, you know, I think is, uh, is a little way away. Standing back and having a look, not just the UK government, but different parts of the world, how did we handle it? Well, Australia did it really well, you know, I, mean, I would say brilliantly, because uh, although the economy has taken a hit, you can walk around Sydney at the moment, even Melbourne will be will be back to some sort of normality because the, the government has effectively suppressed it. You know, it's been tough. State borders have been closed. But look at where Paris and London are now and what's happening in the United States and compare that with what is happening in Australia. But we are, but don't forget, Ed, we are an island. Oh, I know, but we are, the UK is an island too. You know? <laughs> it's true. Closely. It is true, <laughs> yes. I mean, I, uh, I do think that... Um, you know, I, I was speaking to a lady my wife and I have who cleans our apartment and her mother and sister died with COVID. You know, people all around. I, I, I do think the, and, and you know, the, the number of health workers here who've died with COVID, the number of doctors, the nurses, it's very, very substantial. It always annoys me when I hear people try to minimise COVID and pretend it's some sort of super flu. You know, it's not the flu. You know, I mean, the prime minister here nearly died and people are scared here. You know, I mean, I walk around London, I see young people. I see hardly anybody of my age uh, on the streets, you know, because if I got it at my age, I'd have a 10% chance of dying. But what about the mixed messages I'm getting from the World Health Organization? The, the two ways to look at that, you know, I mean, I, I put aside... Uh, did the virus inadvertently escape from a laboratory? It's clear that nobody does that deliberately to their own population. So it wasn't done deliberately. Uh, all of the evidence I, I'm seeing suggests it's a natural uh, virus, but more information will emerge in time. China is probably the country which has dealt with it most effectively and uh, getting back to normal most rapidly and its economy is starting to grow. Uh, it's quite paradoxical that the more authoritarian a country, uh, the more effective it can deal with a pandemic. I think that's one lesson we've uh, we've learned from this, you know, that it's harder for democratic countries, but, you know, thank goodness we, we are democracies. The key mantra from the WHO from day one has been test and trace. And if you take that as the key message, the key thing is get the incidents down enough so they're not you're not overwhelmed with cases and you have few enough cases that you can isolate them and test their contacts and get them to quarantine for two weeks so it doesn't run rampant across the population and you keep what's called the R factor down. And that's been WHO message uh, from day one. The other thing about this is that it's absolutely apparent that a pandemic like this is a world problem and can only yes. be dealt with effectively by nations working together. You know, um, if you look at how it spread at a time when people were moving around the world a lot, it was like a wildfire from country to country. And, uh, you know, who would have thought that something from Wuhan province would overwhelm the health system in northern Italy uh, just a few weeks later uh, and then 
come close to doing the same thing in the UK, you know, a few weeks after that. Nobody would have thought that possible. We do therefore need an effective global response. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm very hopeful the United States will come back into WHO. Uh, the UK has increased its funding considerably. And I think the Australian government is still standing behind the WHO fairly strongly. The only reason I brought that up, Ed, I, there was a comment by WHO just recently where they said, do not advocate lockdowns as the primary means to control the yeah, virus. Yes, no, exactly. A, a, a lockdown is the only means we currently have when the R factor is out of control and cases are growing exponentially. Because And the only real reason for a lockdown is to prevent Northern Italy, to prevent your health system from being overwhelmed so bodies are being stacked in corridors and people can't be treated. That, in the end of the day, is the only reason. So it's a, it's a tool to be used surgically and as a last resort. And I think increasingly, not for whole countries or regions, but for very target areas. So the, the, the key aim is not to have a lockdown, but to keep the caseload down so you can deal with it with test and trace, with good uh, public health, and for everybody else to be careful, you know, wear your mask, do your social distancing, wash your hands. Have you been impressed by the level of communication from the UK government? No, not not really. I mean, I... Uh, I'm, I'm loath to criticise them, you know, because it's an awful situation. And how would anybody do uh, under that type of pressure, you know, with the, the deep blue sea of the economy and the devil of, of fatalities in vulnerable people? I mean, it's a it's an incredibly difficult line to follow. I think the um, I just get the feeling that that's been much better in Australia than it has here, and I'm a supporter of the government in general. You know, I think their, their general approach has been okay. I think they've got a few things wrong, but they've got a lot right. But we have seen here exhaustion in health workers now, who many of whom are just getting at the end of the, you know, their ability to cope really. And the general public, for a variety of reasons, don't have anything like the degree of confidence in the government they did at the start of the pandemic. And that's in part because, you know, the UK is an advanced country you know, when it's all out, has the probably the uh, population corrected highest death rate in the world, or at least it's top two. And the economy has been much more affected than any other country in Europe. And th this country had warning, you know, because Italy had already happened and it hadn't happened here yet. So, so I, I think it's always wise to be, it's always easy to be wise after the event. Uh, but I think there are a lot of learnings here. And the government here has taken it on board. You know, I mean, it knows it didn't get everything right. It's got some things really good. The treasurer, the chancellor here, the treasurer is called the chancellor, as you know, has been brilliant. He's uh, supporting industry, supporting the economy, yet doing it in a measured and careful way. I think he's somebody who's come out of this with a hugely enhanced uh, reputation. I mean, it was very unfortunate here that the prime minister, who's a pivotal person in government and, and a good person, became so desperately ill for so long, you know, in the in the middle of the crisis and nearly died. That, I think, uh, you know, with a very uh, hierarchical system of government, I think did impair the, this country's response for a while uh, because they're so dependent on the prime minister being there and, and been doing his job. King's College, London. Do you have a large intake of international students? And if so, what's been the impact? Yes, we do. It's a, uh, it's about half, about half. If you include EU students, it's about half, half UK and half from outside the UK. Outside the UK is about 15% from continental Europe and about 35% from the rest of the world. It's always been like that, though, because London's always been such an international city. You know, so if you, the, the mix wouldn't have been that different if you went back 150 years, but the, uh, the students would have been coming from what was then the British Empire. The difference with the Australian universities is that the young people here come from everywhere. You know, they come from States, Africa, Latin America, Middle East in huge numbers. Uh, so we're not overly dependent on, on any single country. And uh, I, I think Australia arguably some Australian universities have become a little too dependent on, on students from North Asia. So what are they going to do, Ed? Well, I, I mean, that's, I think, uh, an issue for Australia generally that I don't have the answer. I, I spent a lot of time working in China. You know, when I was running Monash, I opened a postgraduate university there for the central government. And at King's, we have uh, strong research links with China. We're currently opening a medical university in Shenzhen. 
I think we will eventually get to an equilibrium where China and the West work together with more cohesion uh, than currently appears to be the case. And we get back to just recognizing that we have different political systems, but we can work together uh, economically. I think it's obviously more crucial for Australia than for any other single country that that's achieved because of where Australia's exports go. So how do you think Australia is actually engaging with China? And vice versa, how is China engaging with the rest of the world? I can only give you an outsider's perspective, you know, so I, so let me give you a spectrum. We had a situation 10 years ago when closer collaboration was happening month by month. People were listening to each other. We now have a somewhat different situation, you know, so we've got, we've got the United States on the one hand, and, you know, I don't know whether you believe in what people call this Thucydides trap, which is that, you know, the existing great power gets very anxious when it's about to be supplanted by another great power. But whether it's this Thucydides trap or whatever, tension between China and the United States is very high. Some sort of correction is occurring. And I think most people would feel that in part that correction is a good thing, but maybe it's starting to go a little bit too far because anything that destroys the global trade system is not good for the planet. And then you have countries like Germany and continental Europe, which have a more intermediate position. They're maintaining good relationship with China and with the US, perhaps acting almost potentially as an honest broker. The UK is a little more towards the US than continental Europe, but not nearly as far uh, as Australia is at the moment. So Australia, I think, is seen around the world as the country which is most aligned with the extreme US position. I mean, obviously, there are reasons for that in relationship to national defence and the history of the US uh, having saved Australia uh, from Japanese invasion in the Second World War. So I think one has to understand that. I would like to see Australia just nudge back a little bit to, uh, you know, always be a little bit more US aligned, but a, to, a little bit to uh, perhaps not being the most aligned country in the world with the US position at a time when the US position is probably a little bit more extreme uh, than is helpful for the US itself. Uh, and I'd like to see Australia influence its great friend, the US, you know, just to move a little bit more uh, towards more normal trade relations with China. I'm really talking here about trade. And, uh, you know, so we'll see. I think it'll happen. You know, I'm very, I'm very optimistic about that. Has the UK played it well with China? Um, the UK is more intermediate, you know. So um, obviously, if you follow these things, I'm way out of my depth here. You know, the... Uh, uh, the, the shorthand for where a country sits with China at the moment is what's happened with uh, Huawei, right? And uh, the UK uh, was working fully with Huawei until a few months ago when it announced a plan to dissociate itself from Huawei. But if you look at the detail, it's a very slow plan over quite some years. So it gives time for uh, further realignments to, uh, to occur. You said you've had a lot of experience in China. How do Chinese think? Oh, they're very, the, the word, you know, if you know Chinese people, they're very like us. They, they have a sense of humor. They like a drink. They like a laugh. They gamble. They, they love their families. I mean, they're just wonderful people. They're great people to work with. And of course, fantastically able, you know, as a, uh, as a nation, you know, hardworking and diligent. So, you know, there's, there's no doubt that the, the rise of China will continue. I mean, it's, uh, you know, China is going to be a dominant force in the world now for uh, for centuries in, uh, in all likelihood. One thing I have seen in China, though, you could argue whether this is a good thing, because I've seen it in Australia too. You know, Australia has become a more nationalistic country over the last 30 years or so. And that's a good thing. It's, it's people taking pride in their own country. And China has rediscovered a degree of national esteem in the last 10 to 15 years that it didn't have. You know, it's it's remembered that for, for the last 2,000 years, for most of it, for a 1,000 years, it was the Romans in the West and the Chinese in the East. Uh, and they've, they've remembered um, that fantastic tradition. And they, you know, they see themselves now as, uh, 
as a really major uh, international player, which of course they are. Mm. Brexit, how's it all going? You know, the two views of it, you, uh, uh, I think it's going to be a, a difficult compounding factor for the UK economy. You know, one view, you see, I, I, I mean, if half of your trade is in a, a privileged trade zone, and most international investment in your country has come because of access to that market, it's a very dangerous thing to give that market away. And so the crucial thing now is whether a trade deal can be done. It's looking doubtful at the moment, but I guess there's still a, the hope of a last minute deal. If a trade deal can't be done, it'll be very damaging for the economy here. People will argue that, you know, Brits are resilient and can do almost anything. And, you know, you go back long enough, they conquered half the world. Well, those days have gone. You know, Nobody wants those days to come back. I have a feeling it's just going to be a harder journey. Uh, and I do worry about London, which, you know, had become such a great global capital, really on the back of being the capital city of Europe for all intentional purposes. And to give that away lightly, you know, a, a lot of good things have to happen to make up for that. What would you see the shift going to then if it's going to move out of London? I think it'll just, I mean, it won't be anywhere in Europe. It will just because nowhere else in Europe has the capacity to be a great global capital. London will continue to be a great global city. But, you know, I mean, it, it reached a stage um, within the last 10 years when it was the great global city, you know, however measured. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, Tokyo, Shanghai, uh, New York uh, will uh, catch up with London. Uh, London will hang in to that group at the top of the marathon. But I'm, I'd worry that it will lead the pack because the, the financial services and banking sector here, which has been so massive, uh, although it deals with the world, uh, a lot of it has been the, uh, the, the, the centre of those activities for the European continent. So what is the, uh, the state of the economy for the average Joe Blow in London or in, across the UK? How tough is it? It's awful. Uh, and this isn't, doesn't relate to Brexit at all. There's been no negative impact of Brexit as of yet because we're still in the transitional year and hopefully a trade deal will be done and you know people will, will sensibly negotiate that so it won't be too bad. But the effect of COVID on the UK has been more than on any advanced economy. And that's because it's a service economy here and not an industry-based economy. I mean, like Victoria, you know, Victoria is a, Melbourne's a service economy. And a service economy is affected more than anything uh, when human movement essentially stops. I live uh, on Chancery Lane in a, in a, in a Grace and Faber apartment. And the uh, right in the centre of uh, legal and commercial London, there are literally thousands of little restaurants and food store and coffee shops around us all shuttered up. I would imagine that a lot of those will not reopen. You know, the 100 plus theatres in the West End have had no income for uh, uh, since the start of the year. How will uh, those hundreds of thousands of people uh, who support that entertainment industry get going again? Where will the investment come from? You know, it's, uh, I mean, I'm optimistic that it will happen, but it's clear it's not going to be of overnight, you know, especially given, as we were discussing earlier, the endemic nature of COVID that we're facing probably for at least another year, hopefully though at a lower level than at the moment, even if theatres open, social distancing, you have a third of your normal audience, and elderly people just are a little bit scared to expose themselves. So I think recovery of London, I mean, I hate to be pessimistic because I love the city, but I think it's going to be slow. On a lighter note, how's the poetry <laughs> well, You're a bit of a poet, yes, aren't I you? I am having a go at a fifth uh, book. Uh, I'm about, uh, <laughs> but the trouble of writing poetry in slightly depressing times means that you write <laughs> depressing poetry, and I, I don't like doing that. I, I like writing more uplifting stuff, but you might see. Oh, so you're not an Edgar Allan Poe, then, I'd see a fifth book come out eventually if I could persuade a publisher to do it. Melbourne University Press did the first four for me, but I don't think they'd do a fifth. So what drives this passion? I've always loved words. You know, my dad was a word person. I told you he was Irish in his ancestry, although he was born in England. His parents were Irish. And I think Irish people often, and well, my mother is Welsh. You know, they love music and words. And it's probably the Celtic tradition, but it's basically a, a word tradition. You know, if you look at the number of the world's great writers who come from that rather small population, uh, it's quite a lot. Can I ask someone of your academic background, how do you still keep yourself 
fully engaged and educated. What do you do? I realize that my time of absolute intellectual leadership in med disciplines was when I was quite a bit younger. Others are doing that now more effectively than I ever did. But what I have acquired over the years is a degree of wisdom and pragmatism. So I can help mold general directions and help uh, provide an atmosphere and an environment where gifted people uh, can thrive. And in an uh, executive team way, I think I have got an ability to support and bring together a very gifted uh, senior team. So I see myself as a, uh, if I go to a sporting analogy, I'm a sort of uh, coach player, but the player, I'm just a reserve. I come on occasionally, I'm more the coach, more the manager in, uh, in uh, soccer terms. The art of communication is so important. How have you managed and how have you communicated during this period of COVID and what have you learned from it? Two things. I mean, I, uh, in, in keeping with the team philosophy, I've developed very strong communication through the management structure of the organization uh, with the right messages coming deeply rather than simply hearing somebody on high. But I've had, you know, regular communications to staff, students, through all of the uh, all of the uh, channels that, that one uses now, uh, you know, not just uh, videos and uh, group email messages, but through all of the channels regularly with complete transparency about the state of the institution. You know, there have been so many problems. We had to move uh, all staff and students online uh, about a week. We had to do the examinations at the end of last academic year online, which here in July. Planning for the new academic year, the students are back now, but we've got a hybrid arrangement where online and physically in person are going side by side. Through all of this, we've had to keep research labs open because uh, a lot of the important COVID research around the world is going on at King's. We had to graduate our medical and nursing students and get them into the hospital front line at the peak of the crisis. We, uh, all of our clinical academics went in the front line health duties. I mean, it's been a hell of a time here, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, even uh, Melbourne, which I know has had an awful time, it's been just a fraction of the stuff that's been going on here over the last six or seven months. You're saying farewell, aren't you, fairly soon? I'm coming home, yeah. My wife, Melissa, and I are coming home. And we, we, I mean, I love, I love the UK, but we've been here a bit longer than we'd intended this time. And we, we've got to get back. Uh, our children, uh, uh, we've got a daughter, a son-in-law and a, and a grandchild in London. She's been here for 20 years and it's the sort of family basis for us spending time here. And I have an older brother who didn't come to Australia with us, so I keep in touch with when I'm here. But uh, we have three boys and increasing numbers of grandchildren and our brothers and sisters who are all in Australia and most of our friends and we've got to get home. I mean, I, uh, although we'll be spending a lot of time in Sydney because that's where our youngest son is and I, I've taken a part-time work role there, uh, our hearts are in Melbourne. <laughs> so uh, we'll be splitting our time between Sydney and Melbourne. And you strike me as someone who's not going to sit still for too long. So what's the next big adventure? When you come home? Well, it's, not, it's a portfolio for me rather than a, a major full-time job. I mean, I have been asked about major full-time jobs, and but not really been tempted. So I, I'm going to do some academic work and I've uh, accepted a part-time attachment to one of the major Australian universities. I'll, I'll let them announce it in due course. Uh, and I've accepted a, uh, a senior part-time executive role with a, a massive health company, uh, which is a, a more of an advisory role, but it's a really interesting role for me. I'll do a little bit of benevolent stuff, and I think that will keep me out of trouble. But for any good uh, chairman out there, they should uh, potentially look you up. <laughs> well, I'm always, always open to a discussion. <laughs> Fair enough. Ed, if you were to look back at that young Edward all those years ago in Tasmania and then packing the bags to go overseas. What would you advise, advise him now? I mean, when I look back over my career, I have to shake my head sometimes because I, I couldn't have believed when I was young uh, that I would have had uh, such a varied and interesting career. Uh, indeed, I didn't really have any ambition to. You know, I mean, my ambition was to get through medicine, uh, then become a medical specialist, and then do a good job and do that for a normal working life, and then retire. And uh, it's a series of happenstance. So I, I, I would encourage people to follow their hearts and never become stale. 
And you can do that by constantly rediscovering uh, what you do within a single career journey, but you need to revitalize it, or having the courage to move, because uh, some of the moves that I made took real courage. You know, I uh, moving from being a very successful clinical neurologist with a bit of, with a bit of research to a university role was a really courageous step, you know, because I, well, I didn't know that it would work out. I mean, it did work out, but I didn't know that when I, when I did it. And I, and I think my colleagues thought I was mad. Who did you bounce it off? My wife, mainly. A couple of people I'd come to trust. You know, I've, I've had a few brilliant mentors over the years. I, I mean, that's the other thing, you know, you know, please have people you speak to, have mentors. And there, there can be people more senior to you. There can be people junior to you, just people whose judgment you trust. It's not only incredibly important for support. I mean, it just, it just helps you. I, uh, the chap who employed me at the University of Melbourne when I came back from the UK when I was young, was a guy called David Penny, who was the Dean of Medicine, and he went on and became a brilliant vice chancellor. And he's one of my friends for life. You know, we've uh, worked together on so many things. He's a, and then I mentioned Richard Larkins at Monash, a brilliant person. I had a boss at UCL when I was running health there called Malcolm Grant, who's all, all I mean, I've learned masses from all of these people. Malcolm, uh, was a brilliant transformational vice chancellor. He went. He's just finished chairing uh, the National Health Service, which has to be one of the most difficult jobs in the world. <laughs> and uh, he's uh, a New Zealander, but an inspirational person. I mean, I, I've learned from all of these people. Interestingly, when I was recently slightly tempted with a full-time role, I asked a couple of these people, "What do you think?" And uh, because my ego had been, uh, uh, you know, catered to by uh, by the approach, they said, "Ed, you have to be mad." <laughs> I said, "You don't have to prove yourself to anybody else. You have to be mad. Get on and do some enjoyable things." So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and Ed, if you do look back at this, like you said, this colourful career that you've had, why do you think you've been successful? I think there's a lot of luck, you know, but if I go beyond that, I, I've always believed that, you know, the old adage chance favours the prepared mind. I've always worked hard and, and been in the frame for things uh, because I had some runs on the board. Uh, but but I, I didn't work hard and get runs on the board to be in the frame for things. I did that because I was enjoying what I was doing. And then when opportunities came, uh, they always came to me as with a little bit of a surprise. I've always been willing, I think, to try my hand uh, in a new arena, uh, the willingness to be flexible, probably more than most people with my background. You know, I think the, the thing that makes me unusual career-wise is uh, nothing in particular that I've done in any country, but the fact that I've had achievements in two countries, and I've only done that because I've had a willingness. I mean, a lot of people move when they're young. You know, you spend some years in London. I, my wife and I spent some years there, uh, you know, rounding out, uh, getting ready for a substantive career. But it's a bit unusual to move at a more senior level, you know. So to move from being running health at Monash, which is one of the biggest health jobs in Australia, to doing it at UCL was a massive move. And then moving back to Australia to run Monash was an easier move because we're, we're Australian. But then uh, after a successful time there, coming back to run Kings was another massive move. Look, I, I, Maybe you have to be mad to do moves like that. But for whatever reason, many people lack the courage to, uh, to take that type of move uh, when they have an established career. Very, very wise words indeed. Ed, very much appreciate you making the time today. Thank you very much. It's been great uh, speaking to you. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed it. So uh, if you look through what I've said, if there's anything that, that's a bit of a clanger, just take it out, will you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think it's all very, very good. No problem at all. All right, then. You've been listening to No Limitations.